The easiest way to challenge a governmental claim is to not only to interrogate the data surrounding it, so if they present a press release, you want to find out what's the source of that press release. Um, for instance, Harriet Harman came out with a figure of, um, I think it was 7,000 young women who had, had been um, so-called uh, trafficked in, in the sex industry into London. And um, I think there was a general figure of 33,000 given across the whole of the UK. And I was investigating this whole area. But I, I think you have to be prepared to switch sides in terms of your journalistic vision. So, um, you know, I, I was really looking for a story about who was, finan who was financing and, and who was benefiting from the trafficking of vulnerable young women into Britain. But I was a bit struck by how hard I was finding it to find vulnerable young women. I, uh, I had journalists go out and try to find these, and we kept on coming across you know, people who were saying, look, we've heard about it, but I've never met anybody. So there didn't seem to be an immediate community. And whilst I certainly believe there was, it was going on, I don't think it was an entire fallacy, I just didn't feel that the 33,000 figure that the government was postulating, I think it was 33,000, was um, what really stood up to scrutiny. So we began to interrogate that, and we found that the, the, the number had come from 33,000 was an extrapolation from a belief that there were 7,000 traffic women in London. And that figure came uh, from a belief that um, from a Times report, I think it was, or a Telegraph report, that said that there were 700 Albanian women in London. And so what well, the Home Office had done, and an academic working for an organization called the Poppy Project, which was very pro uh, defending the rights of women and was receiving its money from the Home Office. So this biased organization, and I think they'd accept their bias because they're a lobby group, um, had taken the figure, uh, times the 700 Albanian women and said, well, that must be one tenth, let's say, for no particular scientific reason. Turn that into 7,000, that was extrapolated into 33,000. So you got this totally erroneous figure. When I investigated the original claim of the 700 Albanian women, it actually wasn't 700 at all. It was 700 Albanians working in uh, the uh, vice industry in London. So that could extend it into a whole variety of areas and wasn't just traffic women. So it was um, a, a leaky figure that was built on weird foundations, that was built on a non-existent um, quote for in, a, in an original article. And when I went to the original journalist and said, did you know the Home Office found these ultimate figures from your, your original claim? He just laughed and went, well, you know, this is ludicrous. I, don't, I can't know why they're... Why. And, and all that required was just um, a bit of uh, joining up the dots. So I think sometimes you just have to uh, say, well, where, how do they reach this figure? I mean, it's very, very simple. You know, it's the, it's the why, where, how, what questions that any journalist should be, you know, inherently asking everything and always saying, well, what's the agenda? Who's benefiting from this? Where is it coming from? So sometimes you end up reinforcing something that we all kind of know, but I think it's important in the general scheme of of, of democratic system that sometimes things are quantified. So we know that the Tory party, for instance, has a level of funding from the financiers, but what we didn't know was how much. So we sat down and we, we looked at what it was when David Cameron came into power in, in, under the Tory party or came, um, got the leadership, and what it is now. And we've realized that the financier section of Tory party funding had risen from 25% of the Tory party to 50%. So clearly the financiers have a major influence on Tory party policy. Now, the, 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 the Tories absolutely deny that this is the case. They say there's no lobby influence whatsoever. But then you ask the question, well, if there's no lobby influence, why is it that you charge £50,000 to have a face-to-face -face with David Cameron? Now, these are, these are savvy businessmen. They're not going to pay £50,000 to have a meeting if all they get out of it is a clammy handshake and a platitude. Um, there must be some sort of comeuppance to this. So we, we began to in interrogate this more and more, and we looked at lobbying in general. And we ended up finding things like Eric Pickles having off-agenda meetings in, um, in the Ritz with, with lobbyists that was never in any diary. So you, and, and of course, 10 Downing Street denies this absolutely. They say lobbying doesn't go on, even though David Cameron had originally claimed the lobbying was the biggest scandal yet to happen. So uh, you, I think what you realize after a while is you, the more you interrogate, the more you unearth, 
it leads on to other things and other things. So it's about mixing the, 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 the time that you can invest in investigation um, with also keeping a clear eye on what you want to really find out. Because sometimes you come to the end of an investigation, you realize, you know, there's not a great deal more we can find out about this. Our work is done. We should move on to something else. And I think that's really the job um, of an editor is to make that decision as to when, when you know, we think it's done or when it's time to actually continue to, to move on something.